Hey folks, you're watching The Hungry Handgunner. I'm Nick. I've held off making this video for a period of time, as you may have seen from my YouTube short on why I haven't said anything. We're going to dive into a few things today, uh, discussing mass shootings and uh, the reasons I'm against further gun control and things that I think are factoring into the conversation that are not being talked about as much as the gun control side of things. It's going to be a very uh, frank and open conversation. I assure you it's probably not going to go in a lot of the directions that you might think it might. Um, and I would encourage you to watch the whole thing. However, I do know that time is a precious commodity to all of us. So uh, there is that. And undoubtedly folks are going to say I'm speaking too soon. Other folks are going to say I haven't said anything soon enough. Um, it is what it, it is. What it is. <clears throat> I had to follow my own conscience on that. Uh, so buckle in, guys. I think everybody can agree across the board, whatever your feelings are on guns, whatever your feelings are politically on any number of issues, that uh, we are seeing an uptick in mass shootings. And now, mass shooting as legally uh, defined is going to be a shooting in which there's more than four or more victims. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of these have a lot more than four, especially the high profile ones like the Uvalde school shooting, uh, the Buffalo supermarket shooting. So immediately the conversation always turns into uh, gun rights, right? Everybody goes to their corner and they square off. You got the don't don't tread on me, don't no infringements crowd, and you've got the we've got to do something. Um, and both of those arguments kind of pivot around the, the gun issue. So I think that if we go back historically and look at guns in this country, they've always been a part of our life here in American society from the time of our inception. Indeed, disarming the American colonists, uh, the attempt to do so is a big part of why the Revolutionary War was fought. So the guns have always been there. People have always been able to have firearms to one degree or another. Uh, so if that hasn't changed, and then even the design of weapons today is not that dissimilar from uh, weapons designs in the 50s and 60s when things like the AR-15 were designed. And even leading up to 1986, when you could have full autos, uh, civilian transferable full autos that were readily available, or at least much more readily available than today. So the guns have been here. Um, the guns are not new. The types of guns are not new. So I think that boiling the conversation down to gun rights or uh, gun control uh, does a disservice to the overall issue. And to deny that there is in fact an issue, I think is equally a disservice. So. Uh, may not be a popular thing. I know some folks are tightening down their tinfoil and saying it's all false flags, it's all this, it's all that. Be that as it may, these things are happening. People are dying. And I think to deny that is to deny uh, being in a state of objective reality there. So, if we're, you know, I'm not in favor of gun control uh, because I don't think that's going to fix the issue personally. And I'll just explain that for anybody that may not know why I think that. Laws are essentially ink on paper. What backs them up is, is well, the threat of use of force, right? Uh, any any law, right? Uh, wearing a seatbelt in a car. Simple as it may be. That's just ink on paper. A uh, police officer pulls you over, you don't have a seatbelt on, he'll write you a ticket. Uh, you don't pay the ticket, you're going to go to court. You don't show up to court, a warrant's issued for your arrest. You don't subject to that arrest, uh, force will be used to whatever extent necessary to either get you to comply or in the event that you use deadly force or deadly force is warranted. So any law is essentially the threat of force up to and including death. If somebody has already shown just blanket disregard for any number of laws, uh, hurting or killing people, possessing any type of firearm uh, when they're not supposed to, i.e. prohibited persons, why would we think that more ink on paper is going to prevent? What would make that a law that they would actually be willing to follow, right? Um, the only people that that will affect are people like, chances are you and me, the people that are already saying, look, uh, I may disagree with the law, I may whatever, but it's not worth jeopardizing my freedom, uh, my finances, my 
a life in some cases to go against that law. And we can get into a whole different discussion on uh, civil disobedience and things like that in another format. This isn't necessarily the, the place I want to do that. So if we've established that a law is just ink on paper um, and the only thing that keeps that law enforceable is, well, use of force or the threat of use of force, look at your shooters, look at the profile. A lot of them end up dead. A lot of them go there planning on dying. A lot of them take their own lives. That law does not dissuade them. Uh, the argument gets made, well, if we reduce the number of AR-15s, uh, they won't get them. Well, does it make it any less horrendous if a shotgun is used or if a, a pistol, like, dead is dead. So, and I know the media tries to misrepresent the AR-15 as this portable death ray, but that's just not the case. Uh, it's actually a very, it's not even a full power rifle cartridge, it's an intermediate rifle cartridge. It's actually not even suitable for deer hunting in a lot of states because it doesn't deliver a clean, humane kill on deer. Perfectly suitable as a varmint rifle and things like that, but it's not some ultra-powerful rifle. Most deer rifles are orders of magnitude more powerful. And if we go by the numbers, more people are killed by claw hammers each year than AR-15. So banning that one is not going to drop the overall gun violence statistics, uh, as it were. And you dive into those and take a closer look, a lot of those are suicides, which are tragic, um, and I think that we do need to address that. But suicides committed in a variety of ways, and that's a mental health thing. Again, separate conversation politically and everything, but I think that we do need to be addressing mental health in this country a lot more than we are. Uh, and then you get into things like gang violence and whatnot, so the actual gun homicide rate is significantly lower than is represented in gun violence stats. I'm not saying any of this to cheapen uh, the loss of life that we've seen from these shootings, certainly not at, at school shootings where these are little kids. I have kids near that age that those hit home on a level that uh, is very, very disconcerting. But we need to have a very facts-based conversation about it, not driven by emotion. You wouldn't get a divorce or get married or any significant decision uh, under a state of heightened emotional whatever, right? The decision needs to be made from a logical and facts-based perspective. So I think that's important here when we're talking about legislation that could irreversibly categorize an entire demographic of people as criminals for having things that may be outlawed or bar somebody's right uh, to self-defense and may cost innocent people their lives if they cannot get the tools they need to defend themselves. So that's where I'm coming at when I say I don't think gun control will help the situation. Chances are many of you already could kind of figure out that's how I felt on that. Uh, but we're going to dive into some of the reasons I think these things are happening and some of the things that I think we can be doing to address them. I want to apologize for any rustling around that you guys may be hearing or uh, otherwise visually distracted by. Callie came out here today. She did not want to be <laughs> stuck inside while I came out. So uh, she's out doing what she does as a puppy. But... The other thing we're not going to do uh, during this is name the shooters. I don't feel like they need any publicity, any additional publicity, and I think that that does uh, as a factor we'll touch on. Um, I don't really want them in the spotlight anymore. Perhaps the hardest thing I'm going to say in this whole video is going to be that there are no easy answers. I'm not saying we throw our hands up and say, well, there's nothing we can do. There are things that we can do, but unfortunately, they take place at an individual and communal level and are going to take time to see those changes brought into effect. So we've already established that guns have been here. Um, even the style of guns have been here for the better part of 70 years. So what has changed? Um, well, what has changed in the last 70 years is family life. Uh, it's a huge one. Um, used to be one parent could go to work and provide for a family and you were kind of in tune family life was promoted uh, when you were off work you were off work you weren't mindlessly scrolling on a phone or otherwise glued to a tv or video games not that there's anything inherently wrong with those things but they do distract us from valuable time with our children and if you don't have uh, an ear to the ground or a finger on the pulse with your kids well, it become very easy for a problem to develop in which you're not aware of it. Uh, so there is that. Again, no easy fix, right? The economy is what it is. Inflation is what it is. Wages are what they are. Uh, so again, nothing that we can legislate. But I do think that if we got back to promoting family, uh, promoting parents being involved with their children, 
demoting the importance of social media, uh, entertainment, and things like that, and going back to spending time together and really understanding what's going on with our kids, I think that's a step. Uh, the other issue is if you look at these shooters, and I know this isn't the end thing to say in this she power, uh, girl power universe we're in right now, but if you look at these shooters, again, we're not mentioning names, all of them suffered from having a pretty much non-existent father in their life uh, to one degree or another. That father was not involved, didn't live in the home. This is what we get. Um, predominantly, this appears to be a male problem. These are males that are committing these things. If you don't have somebody training boys up in the way that they should go to become men, I think this is one of those situations where we reap what we sow. Um, and again, I don't, I don't push religion on this channel. I don't normally talk about these things, but damn it, I'm going to, uh, at least in this video. So when you have that environment, uh, boys have no healthy role model of what it looks like to be a man, or if they do, it's not a healthy role model. This epidemic of fatherlessness is raising boys into men that have no concept of how to handle uh, being turned down anger, resentment, frustration. They're not given healthy outlets. Um, they're not given healthy examples of how to deal with rejection, of how to deal with these things that are facts of life, right? I mean, life isn't all cupcakes and rainbows and unicorns. Uh, sometimes there's some hard experiences. There's, there's loss, there's rejection, there's losing a game uh, that you trained for and played really hard for and it still wasn't enough. Those things continue on into adulthood, whether it's getting fired, getting laid off, not getting a job that you felt that, you know, was going to be a slam dunk, or asking a girl out and she tells you no. These are facts of life. They're not going anywhere and it's perfectly normal life experiences, but if you don't have a healthy example of what to do in those situations, and I'm not justifying what they did at all, um, what do you do? Well, it would appear that you lash out and hurt people. And again, I'm not justifying what they're doing. These are just my thoughts. That these might be contributing things to this situation. The other side of it is bullying. Um, you know, at 32 years old, I'm no stranger to bullying. I was bullied in 7th and 8th grade uh, pretty hard for being in band. I was slightly overweight, <laughs> maybe more than slightly. And I was short. Um, I got picked on a lot. But, thankfully, uh, that was before the, the introduction of social media. It hadn't really taken off. So when you left school, it stopped. Um, I had a father in the home that I felt like I could talk to most of the time. Uh, and then when I went on into ninth grade and later on, I kind of grew up and set out and picked up some other hobbies and still enjoy music. You guys have seen guitar stuff. I don't play trumpet anymore, but it stopped at school, right? Uh, it was done. It didn't follow me home. I didn't get on Facebook and have people making memes of me and posting it everywhere and it following me relentlessly. Um, I wasn't always accessible to their hate and to the vitriol and everything that the kids spew. That's nothing new. Uh, bullying's been going on a long time. Hazing's been going on a long time. Does not make it right, but it is something that's been going on. So it's not a new factor. But I think the extent to which kids are bullied uh, is definitely up. And again, if parents are in tune with their kids, maybe a smartphone at 11 years old with access to social media, maybe that's not the right parenting move. I'm not telling you how to raise your kids, but I know uh, me, no, mine won't. Mine won't be on social media for a very long time, and that's going to depend entirely on their maturity and, and whatnot. And even if I did allow it, if that experience turns into something that is negative instead of benign or positive, um, then it's gone. My house, my rules. So there is that. Now, if you go back generations before mine, um, used to be two guys get into it, they fight, it's over. Um, might even end up being friends. It happened to me a couple times. Wasn't really acceptable at school, but uh, you know it, it did happen outside of school. Now. That's, that's its own catastrophic event, and it, there's no, I'm not saying that necessarily fist fighting is the way to solve it, but there was resolution. Now there's no resolution. It's just this ongoing grind of constantly being worn down and bullied and things like that. Uh, not excusing the shooters. I feel like I have to keep saying this. But I think all these factors combined, maybe not one by themselves, but these things combined start creating a perfect storm. Mental health 
talked about it before on the channel. I had a video titled Mental Health and Concealed Carry, and I touched on it a little bit. But I do deal with depression. I do deal with anxiety and things like that. And I think the, the, the biggest reason I made that video was there's this stigma about mental health conversations, uh, especially for men, um, where you're considered weak or defective if, if you have that stuff going on. That's not the case. Um, for whatever reason, some of us end up with a chemical imbalance and these things happen. And there's both medicinal approaches that you can take and there's therapeutic, non-medicinal uh, ways that you can go about treating it. And sometimes a combination of both is helpful. The biggest takeaway is that there's no stigma. If you're going through something, getting help is not an admission of weakness. It actually takes a lot of strength to reach out and say, look, I can't do this. Uh, on my own at this point. So if you're watching this and you're in that boat, um, if you need to email me uh, and you want to talk about it more, I'm not a doctor, but I can hopefully point you in the right direction to start that journey for yourself. Um, get help. I mean, life is too short to go through it with that fog. I went with untreated depression for a number of years and going to therapy and things like that helped. So removing the stigma, especially for young men, um, you already have this competitive drive. Everybody wants to be top dog. Everybody wants to be the strongest, the fastest, the fittest, the most desired by girls and admitting to uh, having any kind of struggles considered a flaw. I think we need to remove that. And again, parents, especially dads, if you have sons, and I know it seems like I'm being very male specific on this. Well, when you look at the shooters, uh, that's why. At 32, I'm kind of in the middle ground. Um, it doesn't seem like that long ago I was a teenager, but a lot of stuff's changed since then too. But I'm not so old that, you know, we're still driving carbureted vehicles. So it's, it's a touchy subject. Um, and I'm not telling you guys how to parent or, or any of that stuff. But please be aware of what's going on in your kids' lives. And if they need help, please get them help as parents. If they're adult kids, push them in that direction. Please keep aware of what's going on in their lives. And as I said, I'm not a doctor, uh, so take this with a grain of salt, but be aware of some medications that a doctor may prescribe for mental health issues, specifically SSRI medication. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, these SSRI medications, if you look at these mass shooters, a lot of them were taking these types of medications. Now, obviously, many, many times more people take these medications than become mass shooters. So again, correlation is not equal causation. But if they all, if a lot of them have this in common, I think it's worth taking a closer look at. I'm not saying these medications are bad. I'm saying that just like any other medication, you need to be aware of any side effects, especially when it comes to mental health. Uh, sometimes these things can, sometimes these medications can make things worse before they get better. So again, be aware of your kids, your young adults, your, your whatever. Uh, and if you're on these medications or you're about to start taking these medications, please just take it seriously. Um, if it's causing things to get worse and you need to talk to your doctor, uh, it may not be a bad idea to have a, a short-term plan or, or whatever. In which case, if you need to turn your guns over to somebody you know and trust, this is not an endorsement of red flag laws, we'll touch on in a bit but take some personal accountability and go that route uh, if you need to if it will keep you and other people safe if that's what you need to do uh, while you get used to that medication there's no shame in doing that biggest thing is just be open and upfront with your doctor if those medications are giving you issues talk to them there's probably other options that they can take or are willing to discuss that might be a better fit with less harmful side effects so again, I'm not slamming the entire categorization of, of medication, but just like anything else, you got to be cautious with it, right? Uh, we learned that lesson the hard way with opioids in this country. So again, not excusing any of the actions of any mass shooter. I'm merely stating some factors that I have noticed uh, that seem to correlate with the uptick in mass shootings. So too have these things happened. The uh, increase in SSRI medications, the increased stigma and lack of mental health funding and accessibility. Um, the accessibility of people to bully people outside of school hours uh, and the lack of any kind of resolution to a bullying situation. I've heard numerous times from numerous people, and I realize it's anecdotal, that if a kid's being bullied and the parent goes to the school or the kid goes to a teacher, nothing's really done about it. So again, we gotta do better. 
uh, the breakdown of the nuclear family, which I know somebody's going to get mad that I'm doing this video during Pride Month, and young men need men to show them how to become men. Uh, they need healthy examples of what masculinity, masculinity looks like. Uh, women need examples of healthy womanhood. Um, and vice versa. Both the patriarchal and the matriarchal roles both offer something to developing children. It's, it's worked for thousands of years, uh, and I think that it would be kind of foolish to discount that now, all in the name of whatever. So, this is not hateful, this is not bigotry, this is not anti-LGBT, uh, or any of that. This is just my thoughts, uh, particularly as we see that this appears to be a male-dominated issue as it pertains to young men. This next part is going to come across as being a bit callous, um, and that's not the way I intend it. I hope that my mood and my uh, emotion is appropriately conveyed during this video. It's not an easy one to make. Um, like I said, having young kids myself, um, knowing people affected by things like this. Um, when people talk about gun rights here, they'll say that, you know, in other developed nations, America's the unique. Uh, they're unique in this problem. It's the guns. It's the guns. Um, we're unique in a lot of things here in the United States. Um, we lead the nation in obesity. Uh, we frequently outsource some of our harder labor to other countries or illegal immigrants. Um, we also are unique in the fact that we have well, one of the most opulent, lavish lifestyles anywhere else on the planet. Um, with that, though, we are also traditionally known as being unique in the fact that we did maintain a constitutionally enumerated right to keep and bear arms. We also have free speech protections that many other countries do not offer, at least not to the same extent. And I think it's important that we take a historical look at why that Second Amendment right was so near and dear to the Founding Fathers when they put that in there. At the time that the Constitution was drafted, um, the Re Revolutionary War, having been fought against the world's biggest superpower, the, the most mighty nation on the face of the earth, um, started as colonies here under the rule of the British government. And there was an attempt at disarmament and it didn't go very well. So having maintained the arms sufficient to fight off that uh, yoke of tyranny, it was important to them that the citizenry be able to do the same should the need arise later. Now immediately, uh, this would get met with all sorts of, you can't fight uh, the military with AR-15s and things like that. And number one, I hope it never comes to that. Number two, uh, that's uh, said in historical ignorance, both of the Vietnam War, um, Afghanistan, the fourth gen warfare that our nation is equipped to fight uh, with all of its tanks and drones and things like that does not lend itself well to fighting against a fragmented enemy that blends in with the rest of the civilian population. So if drones striking the wrong target in Afghanistan and killing civilians was a PR nightmare, um, and it was, imagine the case if that were to happen on our own soil. So again, uh, I think that I uh, hope we never find out, but I think that that argument does a disservice uh, and shows a lack of contextual understanding of military strategy and just what it takes to actually fight an insurgency. So we've learned this over two decades of fighting an insurgency war in the Middle East and well, it didn't go that well for us. It didn't go that well in Vietnam either. So be that as it may, uh, we won't focus on that so much right now as we will the personal protection side of things. Um, when the Second Amendment was drafted, it was common for people to be homesteaders. There was no police force to come and protect them. Um, there was no militia. That was The militia was the people. Uh, there was no National Guard or things like that. So uh, in addition to needing guns to hunt with, which largely isn't the case, um, but we see inflation and rising grocery costs. That may be the case soon. Um, you needed to be able to protect yourself from both animals and well miscreants and other villains or whatnot so i know it seems like i'm i'm painting an argument in opposition to the second amendment from that angle but i'm not as we saw from uvalde as we've seen from parkland as we've seen on countless videos on active self-protection uh, the attack is over 99 percent of the time before the police get there and even if they are on scene frequently they don't do anything so if you can watch those things unfold and still have 
the mental wherewithal to suggest that we don't need guns to protect ourselves because the police, because the National Guard. Um, I don't know what to tell you because that's not borne out in any kind of evidence. The police are there in mostly a logistical capacity to take notes after the fact. Uh, if you talk to law enforcement, uh, and not everybody's going to agree, I'm sure, but the majority of law enforcement that I've talked to wholeheartedly supports people carrying firearms for personal protection because they can't be with you 24-7 to protect you. And they have told me they'd much rather draw chalk outlines of the bad guy than an innocent person just trying to make it home. And to go ahead and get ahead of any uh, comments to the effect of, well, I've never needed a gun for self-defense. I don't understand if you live somewhere that dangerous, uh, move somewhere else. Well, it's great that you haven't. Uh, it's great that you've been able to maintain that innocence. A lot of folks haven't. A lot of folks have had close calls. Uh, a ton of folks have expressed a desire that they maybe wish they would have had a gun on several different occasions. It could have turned out very differently uh, for any small alterations in the way things played out, uh, myself included in that category. So again, and I said the other day in my short, a lot of our opinions are based on our experiences and different people have those different experiences in life and that's fine. Uh, the other thing that we have forgotten as a society collectively is that it's okay to disagree. Uh, if your mind is not changed and you support banning every gun out there uh, when you watch this video, that's okay. It's okay that you feel that way. I vehemently disagree with you and you probably vehemently disagree with me. That's okay. I still respect you as a person. Um, that's okay to disagree. Uh, if you disagree with my conclusions that I've come to as possible factors in determining the uptick in mass shootings, that's okay. And I'm open to dissenting opinions on that. These are just things that I have noticed. To some extent, I will say that, sure, um, other nations have had the same societal changes that we've had. Um, to some extent, you could say it is the guns. But I have to ask, is it worth giving up your ability to protect yourself and your family? Is it worth, when you look at the total number uh, and the total story on the statistics, is it worth sacrificing your teeth to prevent somebody else from using theirs to hurt somebody? I would argue not. Um, and it's painful, and I realize folks are going to say it's dissensitive, it's uncaring, it's cold-hearted. Uh, it, it's really not. I carry a gun because uh, I love myself and I love my family, and I would gladly die defending them. Uh, defending being the key word. I want the tools to defend my family. I want the tools to defend myself and potentially situation dependent another innocent person. I carry a gun because I love what's around me and I want to protect it. I hope I never have to use it. I think that part of the conversation is often lost. Um, nobody wants to hear from folks like me, and maybe you if you carry a gun. They don't want to hear our reasoning. Um, they'll immediately find the most bombastic, uh, self-described sheepdog alpha male out there and have him tell you how he'd put a threat down in a heartbeat. Um, they're, not, they're not listening to the everyday people. And it's important to realize that people on the other side of the gun argument, the gun control debate, they're not hearing from those people either. They're seeing what the media wants them to see. They're seeing what their uh, confirmation bias circle wants them to see. And that's another toxic trait of society today is that we typically surround ourselves with like-minded individuals. And sometimes that's a good thing. Iron sharpens iron. You want people with the same goals and ambitions and people that are striving for the same level of performance and achievement around you to help keep you accountable. But oftentimes when it comes to political or social issues, we do the same thing and we end up in an echo chamber where we are convincing ourselves uh, subconsciously that everybody around us feels the same way that we do or that most people do and the people that don't are the other guys. They're, they're the evil bastards out there that don't feel the same way we do. Um, they're libtards, they're communists, they're uh, NRA funded Republicards, whatever, I don't know. Um, the point is, we throw labels and we go to our corners and we square off without ever taking a second to talk and maybe figure out that maybe the other person's only exposure to guns was walking in and finding a family member murdered with a firearm. Um, and that was it. Or maybe uh, they were a victim of a violent crime involving a firearm. And if only there were stronger gun control laws that would have prevented that. Uh, 
when you get tied up in these emotional investments into these experiences, which is perfectly normal, but if you never take a step out of it, or you never take a step if you're the, the recipient of that emotion-driven stuff, to maybe place yourself in their shoes and feel some empathy, uh, you don't understand. And we used to listen to try to understand. You, know, you have a small child and they're frustrated and they're acting out. And Tell me how you feel. Tell me why you feel that way. Uh, sometimes we need to revert back down to that level ourselves and when talking with somebody else calm down and tell me how you feel tell me why you feel that way and then give me the opportunity to do the same because at the end of the day we're, we're really not all that different right we, we want to live uh, we want to provide for our families we want to make sure our families are safe um, we don't want to get the notification that a family member has died due to a violent attack we just have different ideas of how best to accomplish those things. And I think that if we slow down and treat each other like human beings, that might be a more productive conversation. Again, I completely disagree with gun control. I'm not saying that I support it. But I'm open to having conversations with people and hearing why they feel the way they do. And I would hope that I would be afforded the same courtesy. It's almost like the golden rule that we were taught as elementary age kids still applies as adults, no matter how much we've forgotten it or how much we convince ourselves that we're better than the next guy and it doesn't apply anymore or, well, they did this so we can do that. As a society, we have to do better. As a society, we have to treat people the way we want to be treated. And unfortunately, that's the hard road to take. Gun control is the easy path. It's the easy path because it's ink on paper. Uh, it's the easy path because now we've done something for the sake of doing something, even though it really won't do anything, in my opinion. So I hope this gives you guys something to think about. Now, I've been long-winded enough. I'm going to provide some links and stuff down in the description to peruse where I came up with this sort of information at. Um, again, this wasn't done out of any kind of self-aggrandizing whatever. It's just I have a moderate platform and I kind of wanted to share my thoughts on it, so... Guys, feel free to share it. Uh, be human. Treat each other as humans. Stay safe. I'll see you next time.